Hello my friends, and welcome back to another Baldur's Gate 3 character building guide. Hope you're all doing well. Today we're covering my pick for the number one best build for honor mode. Now obviously, best is an incredibly subjective word, and what's best for one player may not, and in fact will not, be the best build for other players. So different builds are going to work differently for different people. But in my recent list of the top 11 builds for honor mode, I ranked this build at number one as the easiest build to win honor mode with, especially if you're relatively new to strategy games or it's your first run through honor mode, I think that this build gives you the most options and the highest power level for getting through the game and will make your honor road mode run the smoothest. This character is inherently incredibly strong and gets access to some of the most powerful mechanics in the game and does all of those things better than just about any other build. So barring some some builds that use cheats or exploits of some kind, I think that this build is, generally speaking, the strongest build for honor mode and will carry any party to victory. Before I begin, I do want to take a quick moment to say thank you so much to Johnny to my friends for the two euro donation and Mark Carey Jr. for the five dollars, as well as Joe Rundle and No Imagination for becoming channel members. Thank you so much, my friends. I really do appreciate the support. This build will be using Bard, and more specifically, College of Swords Bard, because the Slashing Flourish ability of College of Swords Bard allows you to make two attacks with a single attack, meaning that you're just making twice as many attacks as other characters. If you increase your number of attacks in a turn by getting extra attack, which College of Swords Bard gets at level 6, uh, haste from a party member or a potion of speed, or action surge from fighter levels, you can make even more attacks, because the Slashing Flourish just uses your attack action so it scales with the number of attacks that you make in a turn, effectively just making twice as many attacks as any other character. Not only is this incredibly powerful in and of itself, because twice as many attacks is twice as much damage, it also lets us stack any abilities that work when we hit an enemy, or when we make an attack, more often and more quickly than any other build. These are very powerful abilities in Baldur's Gate 3 that are going to let us do some disgustingly broken things at later levels once we get the right itemization, but even at base, just the ability to make twice as many attacks as any other character means that your damage is already astronomical. In addition to that, you are of course a bard, which means you're a full spellcaster, and one of the more powerful spellcasting characters in the game, so you get to have the best of both worlds and bring all the skills and out-of-combat utility that bards bring to the table. That's why this build, not only is it more powerful than classes that are specialized into uh, each of the roles, it also just does all of the roles, so that's why I think that it is the most powerful build in general for honor mode parties. I'm using Astarian as the example character here, because not only are his unique story abilities incredibly powerful in and of themselves, they also synergize extremely well with this build. His bonus to hit chance and skills in the early game means that you'll be landing your very powerful attacks much more reliably in the early game, and also you'll be better at making skill checks, which this build will probably be doing a lot of since you're a bard. In the late game, his bonus damage scales simply with the number of attacks that you're making, and we're going to be making more attacks than any other build, so we get to use that bonus even more effectively than just about any other build in the entire game. If you're building this as a custom character, I recommend races that either have very powerful abilities in and of themselves, like Dwergar or Halfling, or ones that have proficiencies that can smooth out the early game of this character. In particular, if you get shield proficiency, then that can let you equip a shield a little bit earlier than you would in the normal build progression here, which can uh, keep you alive a little bit more easily, and longbow proficiency can ease your item requirements in the early game. Neither of those are incredibly important, but they will make your early game a little bit smoother. Also, special shout out to Githyanki, who can give themselves intelligence proficiency, which can make you better at dialogue skills if you're the party face. So I would recommend something like Wood Elf or Half Wood Elf, or Githyanki or Dwergar. In general, the normal ones that I always recommend. For our attribute selection, it's important to know that we will be using an attribute item that you acquire near the end of Act 1, in this case the Gloves of Dexterity. And once we get that item, we're going to respec to change our attribute spread to make use of it. So our starting attribute selection and what we will have at the end game will be different. 
In the beginning of the game, when you first make your character, we're going to take 16 Dexterity and 16 Charisma, as well as 14 Constitution and 12 Wisdom. This gives us the strongest starting attribute spread. Our Charisma, will, the 16 Charisma will allow us to make dialogue skills and use our spell casting effectively in the early game. Um, and we can get away with relatively low constitution because this is a ranged character that's going to sit way back at the beginning of the game. If this makes you nervous, it's definitely uh, t totally acceptable to drop your charisma to 14 and take 16 con instead. But this is the... and just, just do this. Um, but I think that you will have a slightly easier time with this attribute spread because you will be able to land attacks and spells both in the early game with this spread. Once you get access to the Gloves of Dexterity, which just set your Dexterity to 18, we obviously don't need any points in Dexterity anymore, so we can go ahead and drop that to 8. We can put our remaining uh, points into Constitution, bring that up to 16, get 2 points in Wisdom to bring ourselves up to 14 uh, for maximized Wisdom saving throws, and then we can go ahead and raise our Charisma to 17, because there's several ways in the game to get an odd numbered point in charisma and so just having 17 will let us hit 20 pretty easily uh, in the game which will be very nice and put our remaining two points into strength if you know you're not getting ethel's hair and you're not using the mirror of loss you can drop your charisma to 16 and just put those two points in strength instead for the jump distance etc but the 17 charisma means that we can pretty easily have 20 charisma by the end game which while we don't need it for our spell casting is very nice especially for fights where we aren't getting a lot of arcane acuity stacks for our skill selection, we're going to take uh, as many dialogue skills as we want. Usually you can drop performance if you don't uh, feel like you need it. You probably don't need all four, but um, having all four is nice. But I do like getting sleight of hand on this character. We Remember, we'll have high dexterity. Uh, so we'll be able to lockpick, and then you can pick up stealth if you want to make stealth checks. For this example, I'm just going to take all of these dialogue skills, but... Um, and sleight of hand, but you can pick up stealth as well to allow you to do broken stealth archery things later on in the game. Then for our spell selection, we're going to go ahead and take Minor Illusion and Friends in the early game. Um, Friends is very useful even on Honor Mode, because while it will turn enemies hostile, you can either fast travel out of the location after using it and just wait for enemies to stop patrolling. Um, and there's also several fights in the game where you get to make dialogue checks and then fight those uh characters anyways. Uh, the dialogue checks just make the fight easier, so friends is consequence-free if you know you're going to fight something. Minor Illusion is uh, incredibly powerful and basically required for every character. We don't really need Vicious Mockery at this point, though we will pick it up later down the line, but since we're going to be making bow attacks, those will be more powerful than Vicious Mockery cast as a cantrip anyways, so we don't need the combat spell because we have the combat weapon. For our actual spell selection, you're going to take Healing Word and Dissonant Whispers. Dissonant Whispers is very useful um, in the early game because it just stops an enemy from moving for two full turns, no concentration if they fail the saving throw, and then you can just shoot them because you're a ranged character. For our remaining two spells, we're going to pick up Long Strider. If you don't have it elsewhere in your party, it's very important to have access to Long Strider somewhere. This is a ritual spell, so it doesn't cost you spell slots to use and just makes your entire party 10 feet faster. Um, and then you can take utility spells like Disguise Self or Speak with Animals. Um, we've got the combat spells that we need, although you can also pick up Tasha's Hideous Laughter. That will be useful later on down the line. But for now, I'm just going to say take Disguise Self because that will just make some of your dialogue skills earlier, can get you slightly better prices for merchants in the early game by disguising as a member of their race, so it's just a useful spell to have access to in general. Only other thing to do at level 1 is make certain you pick the right instrument, because if you don't it will completely ruin your character, and then we're going to move on to level 2. At character level 2, we're going to take a second level of Bard, getting access to Song of Rest and Jack of All Trades. Song of Rest is secretly one of the best abilities in the game, um, because it just makes your adventuring days so much smoother, it gives you a great option for healing your party if you've taken some damage in a fight, and will be extremely useful later on because we will have so many short rest resources that we want to restore with Song of Rest. We also get an additional spell, and the combat option here is probably to take Tasha's Hideous Laughter, not because it's going to be incredibly useful right now, but because it's an enchantment spell, which will be very important later, and it's very good for certain boss fights later down the line. If you, uh, 
want to, though, one of the great things about this build is that it is very flexible and has lots of room for role-playing options in addition to just the combat power options. So you can take something like Speak with Animals if you are interested in, in grabbing that at this stage. There are enough potions of Speak with Animals in the game that you probably don't need to learn it as a spell, but I do want to mention that this build has a lot of room for customization, even customization into non-combat things, uh, which is one of the strengths of it. At Bard level 3, we get access to our subclass, as well as second level spells. And for our subclass, we are, of course, going to take College of Swords. This gives us access to the three ranged flourishes. Defensive flourish is less useful for this character than it is for a melee uh, swords bard, though still pretty useful. Plus 4 to armor class is not a bad ability, and if you find yourself in a bad situation, you can definitely use defensive flourish to give yourself a better chance of surviving. Uh, mobile Flourish is extremely powerful because it pushes enemies back 20 feet, which is further than most pushes, and there's no saving throw. Uh, you just hit the, if you hit them, they get pushed, and then you can teleport to the target. So you can use Mobile Flourish both to reposition yourself and also to reposition enemies. Extremely powerful tool. Uh, but the real star here is Slashing Flourish, which just lets you attack twice in a turn in exchange for an Inspiration die. The amazing amount of damage that this does is the core of this build, and is what makes it so obscenely powerful. We also get access to a fighting style. Now, unfortunately, the fighting styles available to Bard aren't the most impactful for us. We won't be using dueling, because we're not going to be using a one-handed weapon. Um, and we probably won't be using two-hand crossbows with two-weapon fighting, because the best weapons for us are typically going to be longbows. But I'm going to take two-weapon fighting instead uh, anyways, just because there might be points in the game where you have access to two good hand crossbows and want to use two-weapon fighting, rather than using um, a, a longbow, just based on what order you do things in and what weapons you have. For our spell selection here at level 2, we're going to go ahead and take Cloud of Daggers. This just gives us an incredible combat option. While we do great damage already, Cloud of Daggers is just a very powerful tool to have in your arsenal. It is There is no saving throw associated with it, so it just does um, incredible damage. It is the best single target damage spell in the game at level 2, uh, and also it's AoE, so it is incredibly strong and is the one that you're going to want to focus on most of the time. You can, at this point, replace one of your level 1 spells with a level 2 spell if there's one that you find you're not using particularly, but there aren't that many level 2 spells that we desperately need to have at this stage. We're happy just having Cloud of Daggers to concentrate on while we shoot things with our arrows. Finally, and I almost forgot this because they put it in sort of a weird place when you level up, at level 3, Bard gets access to two skill expertises, meaning that you double your proficiency bonus in those skills, and we can uh, put that into sleight of hand, making us even better at lockpicking, and persuasion, making us even better at the most important dialogue skill in the game. One of the amazing things about this character is that it provides so much combat power, but also so much utility, so getting these expertises enhances that even further and means we will never fail skill checks that we happen to want to pass. That's it for level 3, let's go on to level 4. At character level 4, we get access to our first feat, and the feat that we are going to take is Sharpshooter. Sharpshooter gives us plus 10 damage per attack, and remember that we have Slashing Flourish, so every attack we make when we have Inspiration Dice available is actually two attacks. Sharpshooter is applied fully to the Slashing Flourish attacks, so we are effectively getting twice as much value out of one of the best feats in the game as any other character does. Now, it is true that Sharpshooter for us is a real penalty. The minus 5 to hit is definitely difficult at this point in the game, but you can mitigate the... Uh, the hit penalty by attacking from advantage, by starting combats hiding, by attacking from high ground to gain the plus two to hit, and by using Astarian's unique ability if you happen to be Astarian. Later on in the game, of course, we will get even more bonuses to hit, and this character does benefit from an ally with Bless or something like that to make their attacks more reliable, but Sharpshooter is just so much damage and so frequent... Uh, it, Sharpshooter is so much average damage that it is absolutely worth grabbing at this level, even if occasionally you have to turn it off. As a rule of thumb, if your chance to hit is 30% or lower, turn off Sharpshooter and just make your attacks normally, um, but for the most part, you 
will just increase your average damage if you leave Sharpshooter on all the time in order to just get the most possible damage out of your attacks. We also get an additional cantrip, and the cantrip that we're going to take here is Vicious Mockery. The reason for this is that it's an enchantment cantrip, and later on we're going to gain the item the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel, which will let us cast any illusion or enchantment spell as a bonus action after we make an attack. This character is going to attack extremely frequently, um, and sometimes you won't have a, a spell slot that you actually want to cast as a bonus action, so just having Vicious Mockery to add a little bit of extra damage to your attacks can be pretty reasonable uh, on your turns, just to give you a good use for your bonus action. Um, it's not a massive boost, and you won't use this in place of actually making arrow attacks, but this is a very good tool to have later on down the line. Similarly, for our spell selection, here we're going to take Hold Person. This is another enchantment spell, and because we will have our save DCs be extremely high, and we'll be able to cast enchantments as a bonus action, thanks to itemization, having access to this is... Uh, just means that this character is going to be able to lock down enemies extremely reliably. Even without being able to cast this as a bonus action, Hold Person's just a very good spell. If you can hit an enemy with it with Hold Person, then you get automatic critical hits against them, which is incredibly strong uh, for this character who's attacked so frequently and with such high damage. Nothing else that we need to pick at level 4, although again, you can replace a spell if there's one from a lower level that you find you're not using. If you are replacing a spell, you can pick up utility like invisibility, um, or you can pick up uh, something like enhance ability. I wouldn't recommend casting enhance ability for most conversations or skill checks, but it can be very useful to have later on down the line. Uh, so just pick that up that kind of thing if there's a spell that you want to get rid of. Let's go to level 5 now. And at character level 5, we get access to third level spells. Third level spells are where most spellcasters hit their huge power spike, and uh, Bard is no exception. We get some really excellent spells at third level. And the one that we're going to pick up here is going to be Hypnotic Pattern. This is an illusion spell, so later on we'll be able to cast it as a bonus action, uh, but also it's just one of the best crowd control spells in the game. It's a huge AoE, it completely shuts down an entire encounter, and is very easy to, to just win encounters by landing a good hypnotic pattern. You can also replace a spell at this point if you, again, find if find there's a spell that you're not using. I would suggest at this point probably replacing Cloud of Daggers, because we are now likely to be concentrating on Hypnotic Pattern if we're concentrating on a spell, though if you're still using Cloud of Daggers regularly this is optional, but you can replace Cloud of Daggers with Glyph of Warding as a combat ability that creates an ice surface, or with Plant Growth because that can help keep enemies away from you. Uh, quartered Movement Speed is of course very powerful to be able to inflict on enemies when you're an archer because it means they're stuck and you can just shoot them. But we're going to grab Glyph of Warding here just to give us a uh, a non-concentration combat option, um, and that will just be very powerful to have as well. Then, at Bard level 6, things get really exciting for the Swords Bard. Firstly, because you are a level 6 Bard, you get access to extra... Uh, at, at level 6 Sword Bard, you get access to extra attack, and remember, each attack that we get is actually two attacks. So we are making twice as many attacks as other characters. We were making three attack, uh, two attacks per round, now we're making four attacks per round. We also, at level 5, got the ability to refresh our Inspiration Dice on a short rest instead of a long rest, so we can do this many, many more times per day. We get to pick up another spell, so you can take something like Enhance Ability, which will be pretty useful for certain skill checks near the end of Act 1, and later on in the in the game there will be uses for Enhance Ability. Um, or you can take another Combat or Utility spell if there's one that you feel like you're missing. Other than that, though, no major decisions to make at level 6, so let's go on to level 7. At character level 7, there's actually a number of different directions that we could take this character, and so we have some decisions to make. Because we have extra attack and font of inspiration and third level spells from 
Swords Bard already. We have most of the main things that we are grabbing from Swords Bard. So while we can continue to take Bard levels, we can also branch out and add in levels of other classes. Some example directions that we could go with this character are taking three levels of Rogue for Assassin Rogue and three levels of Ranger for Gloomstalker Ranger to make ourselves significantly better at archery. Or we could take a Wizard level to gain access to all the Wizard spells. Or we could take Fighter levels to gain additional uh, martial options. In my opinion, the best direction to go from this point is to take a level of fighter. This gives us uh, medium armor, uh, this gives us uh, shield proficiency and martial weapon proficiency for any weapons we didn't yet have proficiency with, and more importantly, it gives us a fighting style so we can take the archery fighting style. A flat plus two bonus to hit with all our ranged weapon attacks makes our attacks significantly more reliable and means that our incredible damage gets even more incredible because we're just hitting that much more often. When you have Sharpshooter, the only thing you care about is just hitting because your attacks are going to do so much damage and Fighter lets us do that and then gives us an even more powerful option at the next level where we get to take our second level of Fighter and pick up Action Surge. Action Surge is the best class feature in the game, just gives you a whole extra turn, and that extra turn, uh, unlike haste actions or bloodlust actions, the extra action that you gain from Action Surge lets you make a full number of attacks on Honor Mode. So because we have extra attack, we can make four attacks, we can then Action Surge and we can make four more attacks. The sheer number of attacks that you can dish out on your opening turns of combat, even before you take into account haste actions, bloodlust actions, uh, Terrazul actions, any additional ways of getting extra actions that you have, um, with this character is absurd, and the burst damage is going to shut down just about any enemy in the game immediately. So that's why I like taking two levels of fighter, but you could also take one level of fighter and one level of wizard to gain all of the wizard spells and six level spells, or lean even more heavily into the archery build and less into the spellcasting build by taking rogue or ranger levels. Either of those are excellent builds. This is my pick and what we're going to be building today. Then, moving on to character level 9, we're just going to go back in to take more bard levels. We've got an action surge, so we don't need any more fighter levels, and we still want to hit level 10 bard for magical secrets, So, because that just gives us access to some of the best spells in the game. Um, so we can just go back to increasing our bard levels, get access to higher level bard spells, all of which are very powerful. At this level, there are two options for spells that you can pick up. You can either take Confusion, which again is a very powerful enchantment spell, so we'll be able to bonus action cast that and shut down an entire combat. And importantly, Confusion can be cast um, into melee because it doesn't hit allies, so you can cast Confusion even if the encounter is very confused and still just shut down enemies. The other option is to take greater invisibility, because you can concentrate on this on yourself alongside stealth checks. You can get off a number of attacks if you took stealth as a skill proficiency. You can get off a number of attacks before combat starts, gaining a bunch of free damage on enemies using greater invisibility. Um, so that just gives you yet another broken option for this character. Personally, I find the, the stealth archery stuff somewhat fiddly and annoying to do and not very fun, so I prefer just taking confusion at this level. But obviously, the stealth archery stuff is very powerful, so it's great that this character can access that option as well. Next, at Bard level 8, we get our second feat, and remember that we've equipped at this point the Gloves of Dexterity, so we've just got 18 Dexterity, therefore we don't need to take an Ability Score Improvement because we have 18 Dexterity. While we could bump our Charisma up, or even take something like Actor, I think that the natural pick is going to be to take Alert. Alert gives you plus 5 initiative, and so in combination with the plus 4 that we get from having 18 dexterity with the gloves, we have a plus 9 bonus to initiative. This character is so strong that after its turn, enemies usually won't get a turn. They'll either be dead or uh, crowd controlled in some way, and so guaranteeing that we go first means that we just win encounters so much more reliably because of alert. I believe the highest initiative on an enemy in the game is plus 10, so our plus 9 guarantees that we go before all but the very, very fastest enemies, and we can guarantee going first 100% of the time if we pick up and equip any initiative gear at all, basically. So alert just makes this character even more reliable, shuts down enemy encounters, bef enemies before they begin. Um, 
with alert and the extreme damage and crowd control that we're providing, you will almost never have to actually deal with what the enemies do if they get a turn, because they simply won't get a turn. For our spell selection at this level, you can go back and pick up anything else. I actually really like having freedom of movement uh, available as a panic button in case one of your allies gets stunned, or we could go back uh, and pick up a utility spell from lower level, stuff like invisibility, greater invisibility, dimension door can be useful for some encounters if you find that plant growth is missing from your arsenal, you can pick that up. Um, I'm going to recommend plant growth as the best combat spell, but honestly what spell you select here is down to personal taste more than anything else. With our ninth level of Bard, we get access to 5th level spells, of which the real prize is going to be Hold Monster. Hold Monster just lets us lock down enemies and we Again, it's an enchantment spell, so we will be able to cast it as a bonus action after attacking, um, and that will mean that we have one of the most powerful crowd control conditions in the game, basically guaranteed to be applied without spending a real action on it uh, on almost any enemy in the game. Hold Monster works on any enemy except undead or if they're completely immune to crowd control effects, so it's just going to let you shut down certain enemies much more easily. None of the other level 5 spells are that exciting for us, so we probably won't want to replace a spell with a 5th level spell, but if there are any of the lower level spells that you're missing, of course you can always replace another spell. And finally, at bard level 10, we get access to additional cantrips, additional skill expertises, and magical secrets. So we can add in expertise in more dialogue skills, or just anything else that we might happen to want. Um, Astarian himself can get perception expertise. At this stage in the game, that's not that important, but it's nice to pass those checks anyways. Uh, I recommend just taking like intimidation and deception to make sure that you can pass all of those skills as well. Um, but the really important thing here is that we get access to another cantrip and we get to take true strike because obviously it can't be a powerful build without true strike and we get to take an additional fifth level spell or lower level spell i recommend going back for a utility spell at this stage uh just any any utility spell that you haven't yet selected is pretty good to have um, at this point so we're going to pick that up and then we get to also take a magical secret magical secrets is amazing obviously because it gives you access to a wide variety of the best spells in the game and the number of different spells that you could take here is honestly uh pretty incredible um whether you are going for more damage you can pick up banishing smite which just lets you add 5d10 force damage to your uh ranged attack um, which just, which on a critical hit is 10d10 and can burst down enemies in a single blow. You can pick up Counter Spell, which is just incredibly valuable for every party. It's the best defensive option in the game. You can pick up another AoE control spell like Sleet Storm or anything along those lines. My suggestion for the two best spells to pick up here are going to be Counter Spell because it's just so valuable to have and so important in late game fights. While we do only get fifth level spell slots here, so we can't counter sixth level spells. Having an extra copy of Counterspell in your party is just incredibly strong. And then for our second spell, we're going to take one that might look a little bit unusual, and that's actually going, because it's a first level spell, and that's actually going to be Command. Command is an enchantment spell, meaning that we will be able to use it as a bonus action, and it is a non concentration hard disable, just completely stopping enemies from doing stuff. Uh, the ability to attack, stack arcane acuity, trigger the band of the mystic scoundrel, and then command all the enemies to fall on the floor means it is a core component of this character's ability to just completely shut down encounters. So these are the two that I would recommend, but honestly, you can take a lot of different options at this level, and um, all of them will be very strong. It will depend a little bit on what else you have in your party, but uh, these two are just a great default. All right, that is the Swords Bard, but of course we can make it even more powerful with items, and some items are very, uh, are incredibly strong for this build, so let's talk about those. Now, we're going to need, uh, as I mentioned, the Gloves of Dexterity are core to this build. They're what allows us to still have decent dexterity and also get high charisma while um, being able to get both Sharpshooter and Alert, otherwise we wouldn't be able to get both of those feats. So the Gloves of Dexterity are the only mandatory item for this build. Um, setting your Dexterity to 18 means that your attacks will actually land. 
We're going to want the most powerful bow that we can get our hands on, and it's more important that we have high damage individual attacks than that we have multi-attacks. So while you can use two-hand crossbows, you are generally speaking going to be better off with a longbow. I recommend one of two longbows, either the Titan String Bow, which adds your strength modifier to your attacks and combined with an elixir of Cloud Giant Strength or Hill Giant Strength earlier on, or even just holding the club of Hill Giant Strength, setting your strength to 19, gives you quite a lot of damage. Or, and this is generally speaking my preference, the Deadshot, because the Deadshot does a significant amount of damage, but also makes your attacks even more reliable to land them. And I just really like being able to actually hit with my attacks, especially because so much of our damage comes from Sharpshooter. We can benefit um, as well from medium armor that has uncapped dexterity modifiers with something like the armor of agility you can have actually quite respectable ac for this character because you're you're a dexterity based character you can equip a shield and still benefit from it while wielding a ranged weapon so you can end up with pretty decent ac on this character i don't actually think that's that important so i like uh armor that gives lower armor class but has a good ability something like the elegant studded leather to boost our initiative can be very valuable as well for our melee weapon, we can actually benefit from weapons that have passive modifiers. So items like the Knife of the Undermountain King that decrease your chance to critical hit, this works on your ranged attacks, uh, decrease your, your number required to critical hit. This works on your ranged attacks, so if you're holding the Knife of the Undermountain King, then you just crit more often, and that's obviously very good. And uh, you can either use two weapons with passive benefits like that, or you can use a shield in order to increase your armor class if you're using a shield. The sentinel shield is probably the best. With these two initiative items and alert, you can literally never lose initiative in the entire game, um, and that's incredibly strong. The other core combo of this build is the Helmet of Arcane Acuity. Whenever you deal damage with a weapon attack, you deal you gain Arcane Acuity for two turns. In the opening round of combat, we're doing eight attacks, so we're going to max out our Arcane Acuity stacks immediately. And then when we attack, we can use the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel to cast... Um, to cast Illusion or Enchantment spells as a bonus action, so after doing our attacks, we can cast a spell. One thing that you will often want to do is hit once or twice to stack arcane to trigger this, and then cast hold person or hold monster on an enemy to make any subsequent attacks against that enemy automatic criticals. Uh, so these two items together are incredibly strong and will set you up for success. In the very early game, also before you get the Gloves of Dexterity and before you have fighter levels, the Gloves of Archery can give you proficiency with longbows, letting you use the Titan String Bow or something like that without having to have a proficiency in it normally, and the additional two damage on ranged attacks is very relevant in the early game. Of course, these will be replaced with the Gloves of Dexterity once you get them, but important to remember that these are available. Also, special mention for this character for Bloodlust Elixirs. This is, I think, the best character in the game at using Bloodlust Elixirs, because you are both a fully powered spellcaster and also uh, an incredibly strong martial character. While the Bloodlust Elixir doesn't give you doesn't let you use extra attack with the extra action, it does let you cast a spell. So you can um, with the Band of the Mystic Scoundrel and Bloodlust Elixirs, if you kill an enemy, you can also just cast two spells. So this is the usual elixir that you're going to want to use with this character. Uh, though, of course, the Elixir of Heroism, Elixir of the Colossus, all of those elixirs are also good, but this character uses Bloodlust Elixirs better than any other character in the game, so it's the one that I recommend drinking. For your remaining gear slots, there's nothing in particular that you need, although it can be very useful to get an item that has Misty Step on it, because this character doesn't naturally get it, and that is very useful for uh, mobility, so something like the Disintegrating Nightwalkers or the Amulet of Misty Step. And then you're just looking for anything that increases your hit chance, so anything that gives you plus two your attack rolls for your remaining Amulet and Cloak and whatever slots can be very good, or increases your armor class or saving throws. Uh, just basic boosts to your stats are all we're looking for from our remaining items. For your typical combat, you're going to open by using Bardic Inspiration and making a Slashing Flourish. You can also use Brace if you don't need to move to get into position. That'll just increase your damage a little bit uh, ahead of time. Um, and then you're going to use Slashing Flourish for two ranged attacks against the most threatening enemy. 
<laughs> for reasonable damage, of course, which will be increased even further if you've actually buffed your damage before doing that. We can then make additional slashing flourish attacks, but we can also use a bonus action to cast any of these spells, something like hold person um, or command. We'll be able to shut down a specific enemy, or we can use Hypnotic Pattern or Confusion to shut down an entire encounter. Then you're going to follow up with even more attacks until all the enemies in the encounter are dead. That is the very simple play pattern that will see you all the way through the game. Um, this character is incredibly powerful because of it, and then if anything uh, still has, if there are still enemies that haven't died, you can of course go ahead and Action Surge to give yourself even more attacks. And it's an incredibly rare encounter where after uh, eight attacks and a spell cast of a nearly irresistible spell, because of course we've stacked Arcane Acuity, so our safety DCs are impossible to resist, that all the enemies in the game, uh, in the encounter, are not either dead or locked down for multiple turns. All right, my friends, I hope that you've enjoyed this look at the Swords Bard Archer, my pick for the most powerful build in Honor Mode. Uh, as always, if you have, then feel free to leave a comment and like the video. Both of those things help me out a ton with the algorithm, so I really appreciate people taking the time to do that. Um, and of course, if you have enjoyed this video and want to see more, you can subscribe to my channel for more of this and other strategy game analysis. Cheers, my friends, and I will catch you next time.